Hi, this is Ask GMBN Tech. It's our weekly sort of Q&A show where you guys get to ask questions and hopefully we answer them. So get your questions in in the comments below. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech or alternatively send them to the email addresses at the bottom of the screen right there and right now. Okay, so first up this week is from Peepers. Hi Dolly, what are your thoughts on carbon disc rotors? Um, I've not tried them to be honest and I'm not overly keen on them. I just don't really see the point. And the reason I'm saying that is carbon discs are used, not carbon disc rotors, they are used a lot in the motorsport world but they tend to be really good at high temperatures but less so at low temperatures. And I'm just not that convinced on a mountain bike that you're gonna get them to high enough temperature often enough to make them work really well. And also I think that there is an issue with them that they don't work particularly well in the wet until you've burnt off that, the moisture to get them working well basically and of course mountain biking the nature of it you know your rides are going to be 50% in dusty conditions 50% in moist conditions so I'm just not that convinced but they do look really really trick and they're mega light although really how much lighter are they going to be than a normal disc rotor I, I can't see the advantages at all to be honest but I would definitely like to try them side by side and find that out for myself so um, I'm not even any aware of many disc manufacturers that make them in carbon so if anyone's got any ideas let us know in those comments below and we'll, maybe, we, maybe we'll have a look at them. Uh, next question um, is not in fact from myself but from another Andrew Dodds, um, Dodds not Dodd. Um, do full suspension bikes bounce whilst pedaling on the flat like they used to when they first appeared? Okay, so basic suspension bikes in the old days used to just suffer from bob and a lot of that was down to the suspension design but also the shock design. The suspension design itself, you're usually gonna get some sort of movement, whether that's squat or anti-squat. So depending on where the pivot point is and the configuration of the suspension, it's either gonna squat in slightly when you pedal or the opposite, it's gonna actually extend slightly. Now, even when it extends slightly, it could still be prone to a bit of bobbing. Again, it's all crucial on the pivot placement and the orientation of all those sort of pivots and linkages and stuff on the bike. So the first obvious one is low speed compression. And that basically helps the fork or shock resist moving to your movement or to small bumps. So that's basically getting rid of that bobbing motion. Now, a lot of earlier shocks used to have pedal platforms. You used to see stable platform valves or, or um, inertia valves on a lot of off-road racing trucks. You think those things had massive wheel travel and otherwise if they didn't have those stable platforms they'd get enormous body roll when trying to get around corners. So that technology was used where they would be resistant to the weight of the actual vehicle but not resistant to bump force and you could adjust that pressure basically where the inertia valve sits within the actual shock piston. And that technology came into mountain biking, it was really good, but then design started getting better yet again. So I emphasize most modern bikes are very good at being able to control this and they won't bob up and down too much. Although compared to a rigid bike, you're always gonna have some movement. Most modern shocks tend to have adjustments on them, whether it's like open, mid or locked, and it has effectively a locked out rear end. Of course, it will move under a big hit and that's basically for um, self-preservation so it doesn't damage the internal shim stack in there but it does mean that you can pedal up a whacking great steep hill and your bike won't be bobbing up and down to your body weight. And finally, some suspension designs are actually designed to completely combat this. And the one I'm gonna use as an example is the VPP design that Santa Cruz use. Now this uses a suspension design that basically when you're at the sag point, the chain tension of when you're pedaling basically keeps the suspension at that point. Bump force will override it, but when you're pedaling, it's not gonna bob up and down. It actually sits incredibly flat. And you can see this really well on the downhill bikes when you see them pedaling the bikes, because they're just not moving around. If you think back 10 years or so on a, on a downhill bike with eight inch travel or thereabouts, pedaling those things was like pedaling a pig. They'd just be bouncing around all over the place. But today, they're really, really good considering you know up to 10 inches of travel. So in answer to your question, long way around, no. Suspension bikes are really, really good these days. Uh, next up is from the imaginatively named Zeus Dreadbeard. What is the purpose of a peak on a downhill helmet? Surely it's not very aero at all. Okay, well I'm gonna answer this in reverse, right? Forget the aero thing because downhillers obviously don't care about it that much because they actually voted for a ban on skin suits several years ago, which I still find puzzling. I mean, all right, so skin suits aren't the coolest thing, but you are racing against the clock. So surely by being a bit more aero, it's gonna help in some way. However, Riders like Loris Verger and Troy Brosnan recently, they see their clothes are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. I wouldn't be surprised to see that band lifted in the future because ultimately it's one of the more pedigree parts of our sport and it's a showcase. So if the guys are going apps as fast as they can, why not make it a bit more error? I think that, that could be very cool. Anyway, 
in relation to your question, no, it's obviously not for aero reasons. The peak is actually to keep rain away from your goggle lenses and keep branches and other stuff out as much as possible. And of course, sun, which we don't get much of in the UK, so we have to rely on to get rain and bushes and other stuff out of the way. And they do work really well. And in fact, a real cool homemade hack you can do in really foul wet conditions is get an old goggle lens that may be scratched or something, so it's worth keeping those and tape it onto the front of the peak to extend it even more. It won't get in the way of your vision, but really does catch that spray that goes on your goggles and gives you like a fine mist that you can't really see through very well. So that's pretty much your answer. And in fact, if you have a look at Danny Hart at Sean Perret in, I think it was 2011, I'm pretty sure he's got goggle lenses on the top of his peak. Okay, next up, a bit more of a techie one. This is from Alex Nicolau. Is it okay to pump up a fork or shock in an emergency using a CO2 cartridge just to get you back to base? Like if you lose air or you release too much maybe trying to get it a bit softer out on the trails and you want to get home. Will a standard CO2 cartridge that we carry on a bike for tires get enough pressure in there to make it rideable? Um, yeah, more than enough actually. I mean, I would not recommend anyone actually do this because it'd be very easy to put too much air in and damage your fork or damage your shock. Because you think a compressed air cartridge like that, CO2 cartridge, they it's about 900 psi It's actually compressed into that cartridge. And when you inflate, say, a 2.4 tire, it does vary on the, the size of the tire, the rim combination, you know, what size wheels you've got. But you can get about 30 psi out of one of those, filling a tire up. But you put that into a smaller chamber, like a shock chamber or a fork chamber. I don't know what the equivalent would be, but it could be cause a lot of damage, basically. But yes, you could do it just to get yourself home. And we've all been there at some point where you've just wanted to tune a little bit of air on your fork or shot and you've let out way too much and your bike's been sagging around all over the place. So yeah, you could do this, but I'm sure that most bike manufacturers or shock or fork manufacturers would be horrified at the prospect of doing it. But yeah, you could as an absolute get you home. But if you do it, don't do it with one of those adjusters where, where it dumps the entire lot in. Make sure you've got one that's got a, a multi-adjust on the end with a little lever you can depress just a t -t 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 and be very, very careful with the way you do it. Okay, next up, carbon related from Frank Castle. Hi Dolly, I've got two questions about carbon handlebars, comfort and resistance. I wanna get a Richie Superlogic bar. Yep, so Richie make really nice stuff. Um, but are they really more comfortable and absorb vibrations or is it just marketing? Regarding resistance, um, I guess you mean strength there. Um, it will be used on a cross country bike, but not for extreme use. Is it risk of breaking a real issue? Or I guess that depends on the magnitude of the crash, uh, where I could break a frame too, etc. Um, all right, so I've ridden a lot of carbon fiber bars and a lot of carbon fiber products over the years, and where many people were very resistant, oh no, they're gonna break this and that. I've actually, I love carbon stuff. Um, so I've seen a lot of aluminium bars break over the years too many to even name and I've broken many myself. In fact, the last set I broke was actually doing a wheelie where they must have been fatigued at some point and ended up nearly punching myself in the face when I pulled up. Um, so it does happen, you can get damaged, which is why we always try and hammer into you to inspect your bike on a regular basis. Cleaning your bike is the best way to do this because it forces you to have a look at everything. And if there's anything you question and you're not sure about it, ask us or ask your local bike shop because if it has got a score in it, that can lead to a weak point where it could break. Uh, back to the carbon thing. Um, carbon can break just like aluminium can break. Nothing's invincible. Every bike part can break no matter how it's marketed. Um, I want to have it at home like you can break anything and it's not always down to the fault of the product you could crash something just for example look at greg minar his santa cruz v10 downhill bike that is designed to withstand the rigors of downhill racing which is extremely hard on the bike but he had that crash where his bike hit a pole and the bike snapped in half clean in half in fact and that was no fault of the bike it's just the bike is not designed for, to withstand that sort of impact so that is a classic situation of something breaking in a, in a way that it's not actually designed to withstand. So you could do that with a set of carbon bars, but I completely trust them. Now with the vibration part of them, some bars are a lot stiffer than others. I suspect the Richies are probably one of the ones that got a better vibration damping feel to them, but other bars I've used in the past include Renthal, and if I ride the Renthal carbon bars, the fat bar that is, against the alloy one, I'm sure in my eyes and the way I feel it that they definitely have more vibration absorption than the alloy one. In fact, I've got carbon bars on both my Scott and my Nuke Proof, and to be honest, I don't see any reason to change. I completely trust them. They feel extremely comfortable on everywhere I ride, but like I said, you can get bars made out of carbon that are in fact stiffer 
than aluminium and might be a bit more harsh feeling so it does depend on the particular one but Ritchie being a cross country sort of pedigree brand I reckon they're going to feel just like you want and I would I would go for them all right next up is a oh this is a tricky one this is from George Batten hi Dolly I'm loving the content I have a caliber beast nut Nice bike that, I know Mike who designed that. And it's got a seized rounded bolt on my crank arm and I'm wondering if you've got any solutions to get the bolt out so I can remove the cranks and clean the bottom bracket out. Um, all right, so I don't know off the top of my head the crank you've got, but I'm guessing it's probably an eight millimeter bolt on there on the left hand side. Um, it's a pretty common solution. So the first thing you wanna do is see if you can get a Torx key into the head of that bolt, a slightly bigger one than the eight millimeter that you actually use. If you can get that, even if it means hammering it in, you might get some additional purchase in order to unscrew that. Of course, it is quite a hard thing to do, but that might be one solution. Next up is to go to your local sort of DIY style store and get yourself a screw extractor. Now, there's one on screen now, just for reference. Basically you drill a tiny little pilot hole in the head of the bolt and then you screw the screw extractor in which it has a thread that goes the opposite way to the crank bolt itself. And by screwing it in, you're actually giving yourself purchase and it starts pulling the crank bolt out. So that's another way of doing it. You might need to get something on that because they're more like a screwdriver layout, like an adjustable spanner or something to help yourself turn it. But that's another way around it. If you can't do it that way, then the old fashioned way is to drill the head of the bolt straight off therefore taking the tension off the bolt and then the actual threaded part that's in the crank, you should be able to fairly easily whittle that back out again. And if all else fails, the other option is to angle grind your bottom bracket axle clean off, which means costing you a bottom bracket, of course, but by doing that, you're gonna also remove the tension because you'll hopefully go through the bolt on the inside of there as well, be able to remove that bolt and hammer out the bit of axle that's stuck in the crank. There's a few different options there. Um, hopefully you manage to get it out. Um, the other option, of course, is take it to your bike shop and see what they can do first before you start playing with it because there is a chance you can make it worse doing this and it's basically making the best of a bad situation. There's no ideal way of getting this off. So good luck with that one. All right, last question, quite a varied one here from Lucas Plus. Uh, Dottie, I've got a Rocky Mountain Altitude 750 from 2016. Uh, it's a two by 10 setup and then I changed it to a one by 10. Now I need to replace my cassette and I started thinking of upgrading it to 1x12. What do you think about this setup? Uh, a 12 speed Sunrace cassette with a SRAM GX Eagle shifter, rear derailleur and chain on there. Up front I've got race face 32 for narrow wide. Is this setup possible? And will the cassette fit on my DT Swiss Shimano hub? Um, also, um, I'm now running a Shimano Direct hanger from Rocky Mountain. Okay, so let's just take this in reverse. So. I did note that you said that your bike has a Shimano direct mount hanger. So unlike the SRAM system and a conventional system where the rear derailleur screws directly onto a hanger that's part of the frame, the direct mount has a slightly different hanger and the top part of the Shimano mech isn't present and it actually slides over the end of the hanger and bolts to it. So it's a slightly more secure fitting, but um, that does mean that you will need a new mech hanger. Um, now I'm not I've just looked on the Rocky Mountain website and I can't see if they make one separately, but I do know that there are a few other companies that do make them, so that's the route you're gonna to have to go if you wanna put a SRAM derailleur on there. But as far as the rest of your choices go, it will all work really well. The Sunrace cassette is actually a really nicely made bit of kit. 12 speed, it fits on a, a conventional Shimano pattern hub. So it's, uh, I think it's 11 to 50 on that particular one. So you get that huge range of gears. The, uh, the SRAM derailleur is obviously compatible with that because it's used to the 1050 spread, so it's, it'll go smaller and up to the full size there. The shifter, no problem at all with that. It will be compatible with your chaining. I think that's a really nice set of upgrades there, but obviously it's key on finding the correct mech hanger. So I would get to work on finding that first if I, if I was you. Now I've just had a quick look online and I found one they say is from Shoreline. They say it's compatible with your model bike, but um, you have to be specific about this and double check this. Um, and if that's the case, then happy days. So that means you can get your one by 12 set up with your choice of Sunrace, SRAM GX and all that stuff on there. So um, good luck with that. So there you go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech Clinic in the bag. If you've got any questions, fire them in. Love to try and help you guys out. Of course, you can contact us through the Facebook channel as well. So hit us up there if you don't wanna do it in the comments or email. For a couple more great videos, click down here on how to take your bike on a plane. That is everything from prepping your bike to actually putting it in the bag. And click down here if you wanna see Neil's video on 
does a chain actually do anything for a downhill performance with suspension. So he's made himself a bit of an idler system so the chain can just roll over that like a free coaster on a BMX and his finds are actually quite astonishing. Check that video out down there. As always, click on the round globe to subscribe to the GMBN Tech channel, tell everyone about us, share it around, and of course, if you like GMBN Tech, give us a thumbs up.